Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, what a joy it is. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bend, every tongue proclaim. Praise Him with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is Daily Bread, and I'm Father Al Lauer. And glad you're with us. And this is the seventh part of an eight-part teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. We're using this book. If you uh, want to follow along, just send in uh, to the address that you'll see on your screen periodically, and we will send you the gifts, the, the book as a gift called Seek the Gifts of the Spirit. No cost, and we'll be glad to send it to you. And we want you to um, join with us. Even if you missed the first six parts, just get it on tape. Uh, we'll send you a, a video, and uh, not to buy, but at least to uh, use, just like a library. And uh, even if you missed all those other ones, I think you'll catch on today. We're talking about the power gifts. And we've gone through five lists of gifts in the Bible, but these are not in a list. These are scattered all over the place. But we're going through, uh, not five, but I mean six, what I would call power gifts. And this should be exciting today, but let's start off praying. And we want to bless everybody. And this reminds us, this water reminds us that we have been baptized into Jesus. We have been born again of water and the Spirit. Thank you and praise you, Jesus. Father, we just ask for your heart. May we want what you want as much as you want it. May our hearts just reach out to people and want everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, may we realize that loving you and telling people about you is the meaning of life and we'll never be happy until we do just that. Lord, we ask that you would confirm this word by doing new things in our life, by setting us free, by healing us, by moving in power. Lord, there are many who have stifled the Spirit, who are watching this program. Stir up the Spirit in these brothers' and sisters' hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing right now. We love you. We praise you. You're wonderful. Amen. Amen. Okay, six gifts. I call them the power gifts. I guess you could call them something else, but they're powerful, very powerful. First one, deliverance. Deliverance, that has nothing to do with delivering pizzas or anything like that. Most people think, uh, when you talk about deliver nowadays, they think it's pizza. No, this is the Our Father deliverance. Matthew 6, 30, 13, deliver us from the evil one. Every Christian can do that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, we have authority. Every Christian, every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ has authority over the evil one. Amen. Mark 16, 17, anyone who professes their faith in Jesus can drive out Satan in the name of Jesus. Everybody can do that, but some people have a special gift of deliverance. Look at Peter, of all people, after he received the Holy Spirit in Acts 5, 16, just with his shadow he would drive demons away. That was astounding. Read it, Acts 5, 16. Paul would just get his handkerchief out and, and if there was someone who wasn't able to come to the prayer, he would just bless the handkerchief, pray on the handkerchief, and give it out to people and say, well, you just put that on anybody that's sick or anybody that uh, the devil's given a hard time to, and they just put it on those people, and wow, they were healed. And people who had demons were freed from that. Now you say, wow, I've I got to use my handkerchief more. Well, it, it might work for you, I don't know, but um, uh, not everybody can do that. Everybody can, has a gift of deliverance, delivering people from the evil one. But uh, there, are, there are great degrees 
in this gift. I have this gift in an exceptional degree, and I'm not, it's nothing to do with me. It's no credit to me. It was just a gift from God. And I know this by virtue of being a priest. Every priest has been ordained an exorcist. And I'm an ordained exorcist, so I have this gift in an exceptional way. And many of you do, too, even if you've not been ordained an exorcist. And, and you can not only drive the devil out, you can attack the gates of hell, and they can't prevail against you. Matthew and 16 and 15. And um, you can command Jesus, uh, Satan to leave, and, and you can uh, uh, attack him with a word. You can attack him with the name of Jesus. You can attack him with, by talking about the blood of Jesus. You can attack him by praise. You can attack him by prayer, by fasting. Uh, you can bring down the devil's stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. You can demolish his sophistries. You can disarm him. The devil uses discouragement. He uses resentment. He uses jealousy. He uses fear. He, those are his arms, and he's got a bunch of other arms. You can disarm him. You can despoil him. You can take back everything that he stole from you. Maybe he stole your mind. Maybe he stole your health. Maybe he stole your marriage. Maybe he stole your kids. Maybe he stole your joy. Maybe he stole your peace. Maybe he stole your hope. You can get it all back. You can get it all back. You can despoil Satan. And you can, you can uh, make a public show of Satan. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. You can crush him under your feet, Romans 16, 20, and you can uh, uh, put him at the feet of Jesus. If you're at the feet of Jesus and he's crushed at your feet, well, where's the devil? He's at the feet of Jesus because that's where you are. And, you know, so when we talk about deliverance, it's not just kind of a little defensive maneuver saying, Satan, get away from me. No, no, it's charge, charge, charging the gates of hell, bringing down the strongholds, making a public spectacle of Satan, disarming, despoiling him, putting him at your feet, putting him at Jesus' feet, crushing him. You've got that gift. The only issue is to what degree, but you've got it to the degree that I just mentioned. You might say, well, that's an exceptional gift, what you just shared. No. Uh, I think everybody can do that. You say, I, I can't do that. You just get out your holy water. You can do it that way. Do your St. Michael prayer. or Just simply say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, leave. And by faith, it's done. Okay. A second of the power gifts. With redemptive suffering or martyrdom. Now, redemptive suffering, everybody is to suffer in the name of Jesus. Everyone is to suffer for the gospel and for the kingdom. We all have a share in the hardships that the gospel brings about, according to 2 Timothy and chapter 1. But uh, some people have this gift in an exceptional way, and some people have it even to the point of martyrdom. Now, martyrdom is not just a matter of getting killed because of your faith in Jesus. Even before that happens, or even instead of that happening, you can have the gift of martyrdom. When you have the gift of martyrdom, or redemptive suffering. Uh, it is, doesn't just mean you suffer a lot, but it means that you can take all this suffering in stride. You, you can just um, not be too upset about it. Like Paul was all beaten up. He was stripped naked. He was chained to a stake. He was in maximum security. You know, you know it was a bad day, to put it mildly. And, and guess what he and Silas are doing at midnight? Most of us would be in the middle of a big pity party. What is, what is he and Silas doing? They say, well, let's sing a little, let's sing a few songs here. Let's praise the Lord. So they're singing and praising God, and they praise up an earthquake. Now, um, to praise God when you're stripped naked, bleeding like crazy, you've got all these wounds, and, and you're tied to a stake, and you're in maximum security, uh, that uh, you need to give to redemptive suffering and martyrdom to, to react to it in that way. Um, you know, like martyrs, uh, uh, when you got that redemptive suffering mentality, uh, it's a gift. And, and you, you shouldn't be worried about what other people think and what other people say. But, but I think everybody, at least it crosses their mind. But a martyr, it hardly even crosses their mind. If, if they say, everybody in the whole world is going to be against you, and martyr says, fine, no problem. I remember Basil, they... He spoke up against the king, and 
his adulterous relationships. And, of course, that didn't make him too popular, especially with the government authorities. And they say, Basil, we are going to kill you. We're going to chop your head off or stab you with a sword or feed you to lions. Or we're going to get rid of you somehow or other. And Basil, instead of saying, oh, no, please don't do that, don't do that, Basil said, best news I've heard in a long time. Feel great about it. Well, it uh, looks like I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, I had lunch here on earth, but I'll have supper in heaven. I can't wait. Hurry up. Uh, you got, who's going to kill me? Well, the king says, Basil, we're trying to do something terrible to you. We're not trying to make you happy. Uh, you know, so uh, count, let's forget that. Take that back. And say, well, Basil, since it doesn't seem like killing you is going to help you any, um, or going to help us any anyway, uh, we, we are going to... Um, uh, confiscate all your goods. You won't have a nickel. You won't have a dime to your name. You won't have bus fare. You won't have a place to lay your head. You won't have anywhere to eat supper tonight. You'll be starving to death. You'll be out in the cold. You'll be homeless. You'll be uh, totally destitute. And you know when, when the emperor told Basil that, a big smile came over Basil's face and said, wow, I've been praying for this for years. I can be just like Jesus. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Thanks, I needed that. And the emperor says, now wait a minute, Basil. <laughs> You're ruining the whole thing. We're supposed to be doing something terrible to you. And he says, okay, can't, forget that one. Let's try another one. We're going to put you out on an island where you're totally isolated. You won't have any people there. You'll be completely lonely. And you will just be uh, just uh, totally abandoned. Nobody to talk to complete isolation and Basil just said oh I've been wanting to retreat for so long and I'm so busy I never get a chance I've been wanting more time to pray I've been wanting to spend all this time with the Lord he'll be right with me on the on the island it'll just be great thanks a lot I, this is a this is a paid vacation for me uh, and, and anyway the emperor said well Basil just forget the whole thing you know well anyway this guy how can you we could all say that couldn't we well, you say, well, not exactly. We all believe, yes, that we're with God and we have no reason to be lonely. We all believe that uh, we don't have to worry about having material possessions because the Lord will always provide and we want a simple life and we want gospel poverty. We all believe that if we died in the, in the state of grace with Jesus, we'd go to heaven. Yeah, we all believe that. But how many of us can have that kind of boldness? Ignatius of Antioch they were uh, taking him to Rome to execute him and on the way he made all these wonderful speeches about oh this is great I, I can't wait for my martyrdom and if I chicken out at the end please don't don't try to rescue me and let me get eaten up by these lions because this is my dream come true well we believe in the principles here but not too many people can have that boldness that's a gift a gift of redemptive suffering and a gift of martyrdom I'm going to close with this particular gift, reading from Hebrews 11.35, an astounding, astounding statement. Hebrews 11.35, women received back their dead through resurrection. There were some dead people that were, came back from the dead by the power of Jesus Christ. It says, others were tortured and would not receive deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. So, they could have got out of dying, or they could have been raised from the dead, but they said, God, don't do either one of those. They sound like good, but I'd prefer to die and live with you forever. Now, that's the gift of martyrdom. That's the gift of redemptive suffering. A third gift is the gift of celibacy or virginity, where you uh, have no sex, uh, not because um, you haven't met the right person, not because you um, uh, don't want to get involved with people, for selfish reasons, but because of the kingdom of God. It's a great, great gift. I have this gift myself. Every priest has this gift, but you don't have to be a priest to have the gift. It is the gift to be preferred. That's not taking anything away from marriage, but it is the gift to be preferred. Uh, that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 7. When we renounce sex for the sake of the kingdom, the world really says either you're nuts or Jesus is for real. I could never take Christians seriously because they're a bunch of hypocrites and they don't even believe in half of what they say. But when you do that, I think you're either lying or Jesus is for real. It does not compute that really 
is a strong prophetic message to the world. It's a sign of the kingdom of God in heaven where there will be no marriage and no sexual relations. Now, we're not talking about people being unmarried. Yes, there are people unmarried. They don't know if they're going to be married. They don't know if they're called to be single. Well, that's okay for a while. But we're talking about people who have chosen to be single. And even if the most wonderful, handsome, beautiful, holy, rich, and perfect person in the world came up to them and said, I want to marry you, they would say, sorry, God's given me something even better. I'm single for the kingdom. I have the gift of celibacy. All right. We've written on that in a book that's called Who Am I in Christ? And you can get more into that by just writing us and saying, send me the book, Who Am I in Christ? All right. Now, a uh, fourth gift is uh, poverty, gospel poverty. Now, everyone is called to have a simple life. Everyone is called to be uh, poor, in, at least by the standards of our world today, but not poor because you kind of are a victim of circumstances and everything went wrong and you lost your job and you blew your money and you made all these bad investments. No, it's poor not because of circumstances but because you have chosen to be poor. It's called voluntary poverty or what Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 says, poor in spirit, poor in spirit, okay? And, and not everyone's called to be poor like that. Everyone is called to be, have a simple lifestyle, but not everyone's called to not have anywhere to lay their heads. Not everyone's called to go sell all that they have and give it to the poor, but some people are. And what a gift that is. That really speaks to the world too. That's just like celibacy. That's a strong prophetic message to the world because the world, the language of the world is sex and money. That's what the world's interested in. And when you say, I'm not having any sex because I'm committed to the kingdom and God's led me in this way with a special gift, people say, you're a lion or Jesus is Lord. That's all I can say. And then when you say the same thing about money, saying, I've renounced money for the sake of the kingdom. I, I live a very simple life. I hardly have anything, but I'm so happy. And I chose that. I could have a lot of money. Uh, I, I could have done that, but I decided not to because Jesus has given me a different gift. Boy, that really just blows people away. They, they, that's powerful. All right, another gift, the gift of intercession. This is a big one, a big one. Jesus right now, what's he doing? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, he's interceding at the right hand of the Father. Jesus was on this earth for 30 years, living a simple, obscure life in Nazareth, three years in public ministry, and now almost 2,000 in intercession. He forever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews 7, 25. Now, intercession means to petition God, but not on your own behalf, but petitioning God on other people's behalf, but not just that, but petitioning God when they're not petitioning God for themselves. It's taking their place in prayer and more specifically, taking their place in petitioning prayer. This is a very, very important gift because of the way God has set things up. The first thing God said to the human person after he created us in Genesis chapter 1, the first thing he said is, be fruitful, be fertile, and multiply Fill the earth and subdue it and have authority over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. We have authority over this earth. Now, when you give someone authority, you just don't come in and do anything you want. Now, if they ask you to come and help them, they, you would do it. But the persons in authority are responsible for getting things done. They're not responsible for doing it all, but they're responsible for getting it done. Say, maybe you have authority over your home. You own this home. Well, you, you have then responsibility of maintaining it and repairing it and things like that. Now, you don't have to do it all yourself. You can hire people to do that. You can bring people in to do that, but you have the responsibility of doing that. That's the same thing it is with this earth. We have authority over the earth. The Lord has given that authority to us after he created us, but you say, I can't believe that. It doesn't look that way. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, it didn't take us long to lose our authority. We lost it by being tricked by the devil. He usurped our authority, and by sin, he took over our authority. And we, who were originally the prince and princesses of the earth, having authority over the earth, now he is the prince of the earth. But by repenting, uh, we once again take over our God-given authority, and the devil is no longer the prince of the earth, at least not the earth where we're at. And so uh, we are a lot to do on this earth. And we're in charge. If you don't like things on earth, blame Christians because 
They're in charge of it. Uh, really blame human beings because we're all in charge of it. But Christians uh, know they're in charge of it and the other ones don't. Of course, a lot of Christians are ignorant too, but uh, at least they, they should know they're in charge of it. Put it that way. Uh, we say, well, there's all these people. They're not asking for God to do what needs to be done. They're not using their authority. They, they should be petitioning. Well, then you petition for them. You not only petition for yourself, but you petition in their place. Now, everybody, because each person has weaknesses, each person uh, just doesn't see everything that God wants, uh, everybody needs somebody to take their place in petitioning God. Some people, they need a lot of help. Like an atheist, they need God to do just as much as a Christian does, if not more. But they're not going to petition God. They don't believe in God. Somebody needs to take their place. A little child needs to petition God. But the little child's too young, doesn't even understand any of this stuff, can't even talk, can't communicate. Well, um, so somebody has to take their place. So we all have to take each other's places in petitioning God. That's intercession, extremely important. Abraham had a chance to save the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from destruction by intercession. He dropped out too, too soon. Moses interceded and um, the people of God were spared on many, many occasions. Intercession makes a tremendous difference. Mary interceded in the upper room. She is sharing in Jesus' intercessory ministry right now. You can't hardly overestimate how important intercession is. You know why Eastern Europe and Russia and China uh, are being transformed right now? Why communism came down? You know why there's an evangelization explosion in Africa and in China and in the Philippines and in Korea. You know why God is forming a church from the grassroots up in South America and Central America, Africa and China in the underground, and Russia too. You, you know how God's doing all these things? These things happen primarily through intercession. That's the message of Mary at Fatima. That's the message of Mary at Medjugorje. Uh, we've got to petition God for one another. We've got to do it like we've never done it before. Many of you are called to intercede, to petition God on behalf of others who are not doing it for themselves, uh, hours a day. I think even the, the uh, intercessor with the least responsibility is probably called to an hour of intercession. Well, brothers and sisters, we've got to get into this ministry in a much greater way. Okay, one more. The last of our 30 gifts. Five lists and then six miscellaneous gifts. The last one uh, of the gifts, and we'll have a concluding teaching on our next program. But uh, this is it of our 30 gifts. Now, there's lots of gifts, as we said before, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of gifts. But um, there are about 30 that are described in the Bible in more detail. And the last one is hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, Love your fellow Christians always. Do not neglect to show hospitality, for by that means some have entertained angels without knowing it. So the Lord sends angels down sometimes so that we were hospitable to them, and that kind of gives the uh, hospitable people a little extra boost. And it, it throws a new dimension into hospitality because you never know if there's an angel there at your table or not. You know what I mean? Uh, the, this, the gift of hospitality is a supernatural gift to provide an open home and a warm welcome. Jesus placed the Last Supper in the context of hospitality. When we share a meal with the lame and the crippled and the blind, we not only obey Christ, but we actually serve him because whatever we do to the least of the brethren, we do to Jesus. So hospitality is really hospitality to Jesus. Hospitality is obedience to Jesus. Hospitality is really the extension of the Last Supper. Hospitality is one of the main gifts that a Christian leader needs. Uh, hospitality opens the door for evangelism, for repentance, for forgiveness, for reconciliation, for deliverance, for healing, for growth, for unity. Hospitality is the power to break down the barriers between races and religions, social classes, and bitter enemies. How are we ever going to get all these denominations out of business? Jesus never did make any denominations. He just met one, made one true church, and that's all there is to it. And how are we going to deal with that and say, well, we need more theology? Well, I guess 
That wouldn't hurt any, but we've tried that for years. What we need is hospitality that breaks down the barriers. We've tried to overcome the great division of racism between blacks and whites. How is it going to be done? The supernatural gift of hospitality. I don't mean just having a few meals together or having a few snacks together. I mean the supernatural gift of hospitality. There is such a thing. And you say, well, I can't see why just having a little meal together is going to remove years of racism. It wouldn't naturally, but supernaturally it will. Praise the Lord. I say, well, just because a person sits there and eats a donut with you, I don't think that's going to open him up to Christ. A supernatural gift of hospitality will open a person up to Christ after one donut. Now, that's pretty good. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Oh, it's a tremendous gift. And many, many of you have this gift. And it, it's just a shame that it's not being used. You know, we, we think we're very hospitable, but, you know, most of our meals are are not with the lame, the crippled, the blind, and the poor. Most of our meals are, are kind of uh, just drive-through operations. And of course, hospitality isn't only food. And we have all these people who are homeless, and we have all these social services and governments trying to provide all these things, and the government is responsible to do some of that. But basically, government will keep you alive, but it'll never set you free. Only the supernatural gift of hospitality will do that with uh, the Lord moving in many other ways. So brothers and sisters, that we're really missing it. Uh, we're not doing that that much, but we need to. Let's pray right now. Oh Lord, we just ask for some mighty gifts of hospitality, of intercession, of poverty, of celibacy, of redemptive suffering or martyrdom, and also of deliverance. Lord, may we use these gifts to the full, raise up celibates, raise up people with an exceptional gift of martyrdom, raise up people with gospel poverty, raise up great intercessors and people with hospitality to open the door for a new world in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power.